Okay, so hi guys, I'm Konstantin. Um, you probably don't know me yet, I'm a TA for the computer scientists guys. And today we're going to talk a bit about contact and distance prediction. So, um, you've probably seen that slide a couple times, right? <laughs> especially at the beginning of lectures, I think, especially in the middle of the semester, you had that a couple times. Um, and I'm starting with that as well because this is exactly what we're going to talk about, right? Um, so, as you recall, moving between 2D and 3D is not that big of an issue, right? If you have the um, full structure from PDB, for example, you can easily compute a distance map or a contact map, and you can also go in the other direction again if you have a high-quality distance map, for example, um, and reconstruct the full structure. Um, this is not challenging anymore. However, um, going from 1D to 2D is a completely different story, and this is the story of today's lecture, right? This is what we're going to talk about. Now, what's important to remember is whenever we want to um, get such a contact or distance map, the goal in the end is, of course, to get to the full structure. So what we do is we use this contact or distance map as basically a set of constraints for the folding process to obtain the, the 3D conformation, right? Um, so this is important to keep in mind because this uh, has an impact on how we treat the metrics to measure the quality of a predictor later on. Okay, so first I'm going to give you some background. We're going to talk about the uh, problem itself and a bit about deep learning because this is the main focus here. Pretty much all recent methods um, are in the area of deep learning nowadays. So we need to introduce some concepts here. So first, contact versus distance. Um, what are these things? So on the left side, you see a contact map. On the right side, a distance map for the same sample with the PDB ID 1CHD. Um, you can already see the striking difference between both in terms of information content, right? So the contact map, the contact map on the left is just a black and white story. This is simply binary. We simply decide to residues are in contact or they're not in contact. Um, what you see here, of course, in the main diagonal, that uh, residues pretty much right next to each other on the sequence level are in contact always, of course. Um, but we are specifically interested in the ones further away from the diagonal, which means more longer range contacts. And basically we say two residues um, or residue pair is in contact if the distance between the C beta atoms in the residues is below eight angstrom. In the case of glycine, it's the C alpha, of course, because we don't have a C beta. Now, in terms of distances, you can see this is a much more colorful image, so you get much more information out of that. You get more specific information for the more distant ones, above 8 angstrom, how far are they actually away? And this gives us many uh, more constraints on the folding process, right? So this is much better to use. Now, the problem with distances is that uh, people try to predict them, of course, but it didn't quite work well, um, at least for, for a long time. And the problem was that people try to use regression to infer the distances because they're real valued features, right? So it's intuitive to do that, but it didn't work well. It only um, started to work well when people realized that they could wrap it in a classification problem. So it's not like you're inferring the distances in Angstrom. What you do is you define a set of bins, basically, and you say, well, the first bin represents distances between 0 and 2 Angstrom, and the next bin is 2 to 4 Angstrom, for example. Maybe have like 20, 40 bins like that, and there's a classification task, and apparently this works much, much better. And uh, with the more recent methods, we're actually on par with the uh, performance for the contact maps. So we are seeing a gradual shift in the field right now, moving away from the contacts and more towards the distances since, well, uh, obviously they contain much more information. Still, for historical reasons, especially in the CUSP challenge, we are still using contacts. Um, and it's important to note that you can reduce a distance map to a contact map pretty easily. How would you do that? Well, you take all the bins representing distances below eight angstrom and you simply sum up all the probabilities in there. Then you get the probability that they form a contact. And this is quite important because uh, otherwise you wouldn't be able to compare to, to earlier methods, right? So this is what we do, but how do we do it? Um, this is the story about evolutionary coupling scores. Uh, this was already introduced, so I'm going to go a bit more quickly over this. So basically what we want is we want a multiple sequence alignment and we're looking for columns where we observe correlated mutations. So for example here, um, in the upper one here, we see there's always an S coupled with a T or an A with an S, right? We always see this kind of pattern. And if we see this really through, through um, many of these sequences in the alignment, we can say, well, okay, there's something going on with this, with this residue pair. What's going on? Well, most likely they form a contact because um, they seem to depend on each other. And that makes sense because um, if you 
uh, change one residue here, and for example, it becomes a slightly longer residue. You need to have the uh, accommodating change in the other residue because otherwise you would break the structure and therefore would break the function and the organism probably wouldn't be able to live um, if this protein is in, in some form vital for the organism, right? And since we only observe what actually works out there, we observe these correlations and this is what we use to infer context. So, um, on a more technical level, how do we actually do that? So, we use direct coupling analysis, DCA, this is the tool of choice here. There are many of these tools uh, like CCMPRED, EV couplings and, and others. Uh, CCMPRED is especially important because it's GPU accelerated, which is important. And we are working on GPU machines anyway, since we're doing deep learning, so it also makes a lot of sense to use a tool that can also speed this up considerably. So this is usually done when, you, when you're doing deep learning anyway. What you get out now are the correlation scores for each residue pair. And now you get all the different combinations that you can have. And you have 20 amino acids plus a gap character. And you get all combinations, so it means 21 times 21 different features for each residue pair. Right? Um, this can look like something like this. If you actually conflate it down to, to a single channel, you can do this by uh, squaring, summing up, and taking the square root again. You get something here, it's, it's hard to see on the projector, but if you compare it with the actual ground truth, this is uh, uh, the contact map from the actual structure from PDB. And you can already see that it's kind of modeling some of these contacts here in this conflated version. And this is actually no surprise, uh, CCMPRED, hence the PRED in the name, was actually used for contact prediction, but has now been superseded by more sophisticated methods, um, especially deep learning. Now, what we use is not the conflated one, but actually the full correlation scores, and this is in the form of L times L times 21 times 21. Now, L is the protein length, of course, and uh, we have L times L, and the 21 times 21 comes from these um, combinations of residue types and, and the gap character. Now, as you can imagine, this can become quite big. So, for a protein with a couple hundred residues, for example, let's say 800, you have 800 times, 800 times 441, if you treat them as one depth dimension. Um, for these large samples, this can be gigabytes of size. And this is something you need to keep in mind uh, when you develop a deep learning system, because you have to handle the size somehow efficiently. Now, um, in terms of output, um, <coughs> we're just doing a contact map, then we will simply have L times L times 1. Uh, one channel in the output. If we do distance prediction, we have L times L times B, depending on the number of bins that you use in your classification there. Now, if you have some exposure to deep learning, you can already see that what we want to do here is kind of an image enhancement problem, right? Or kind of a sophisticated image denoising problem in a certain sense. And you can really view it like that, and this also is a good argument why deep learning is especially effective here. Um, the other reason is that we're having dynamic input and output sizes, uh, most notably L times L in the input as well as in the output. And this is really in the realm of deep learning, and this is also why we need to look at some of the basics of this. Now, um, CNNs were introduced before by Michael Heinzinger, as far as I'm aware, so I'm keeping this a little bit more brief. And this is already an outdated view, but this is kind of the iconic first version of CNNs as they existed back then. Uh, I mean, back then is a couple of years ago, so it's, it's pretty fast in this area. So this is kind of the, the network you would see for uh, object detection, for example. So you have some kind of image, you have convolution kernels, and these run in rows across the, across the inputs, generating feature maps, one feature map for each kernel that you run over is. Then earlier, people used uh, subsampling, they were downsampling these images with pooling layers. And in the end, uh, having a lot of these smaller feature channels, and then going into fully connected layers and into some classification output, for example. But this is not how we do things, so this is already outdated. So let's move on. But first things first, I really wanted to give you another perspective on convolution kernels to make sure that you understand what the basic idea behind that is. And although this looks complicated, this is one of the best illustrations, in my opinion, to really check if you understood the concept behind that. So let's go through that quickly. So you have an input with three feature channels. So that's one, two, three. The original input size is five by five. That's the one here in the center. The first thing uh, you need to define when you want to use a convolution kernel is the padding. Um, in this case, we have a padding of one. That means we add uh, basically a border of zeros around this. Could have more padding depending on what you want to do. We'll talk about that in a second. The other thing that you need to define is the size of the convolution kernel. So in this case, we're having a three by three convolution kernel here. And one of the most important properties of such a kernel is that it always runs across the full depth of the input. So it's running, it's looking at all the feature channels at the same time. 
Now here you see a visualization of the weights of this kernel. And as you can see, corresponding to the free feature channels, we have three by three times three weights um, in the convolution kernel. Now, um, the important thing is that these weights are always going to be the same, no matter where I place my convolution kernel. Okay, and this is one of the most important properties because for uh, object detection, for example, it doesn't matter where this object is, or it shouldn't matter where that object is in my original image, right? It should be detected no matter where. And this is exactly what the convolution kernels can do. Now in the output, and this is also something that confuses some people, um, while the convolution kernel spends the full depth of the input, it produces one single output channel, which also means that the number of output channels that you get corresponds to the number of convolution kernels that you use for this input. And this is essentially a hyperparameter. You need to figure out how many you use. Um, since each kernel will have different weights and will be optimized to do something else, you of course give the network more flexibility in detecting things in the input. So for example, in, in an image translation problem, one kernel might detect edges, another kernel might detect changes in color or something like that, right? In the biology realm, it's harder to say what they actually do, but it's going to be the same idea. Now, if you add more and more kernels, you add more and more free parameters to the system. It takes longer to train. It's more complex, more powerful, maybe. But uh, if you overdo it, you run into overtraining, right? Uh, overfitting problems. So it's kind of a balance you have to strike, and this is mostly empirical. You have to train for each scenario and see what, what works well. So what you often want to do is you want to relate your input and your output sizes. And there's a neat formula to do that. So often you have the question, okay, I have some input size that is given. I want to produce a certain output size. How do I need to define my kernel size, my padding and my stride to actually get what I want? And in many cases, what I want to get actually is I want to conserve the input size. And in our case, this is also true because remember we have L times L as an input and we also want to produce L times L as an output. So we do not want to change the size at all. Also L can be pretty much any arbitrary uneven number it could be like 237 residues and we do not want to down and upsample that again because then we're getting into all kinds of problems. Um, so we usually want to conserve and uh, if you plug that in the formula you see there are different ways to do that many more. For example if you have a kernel of size 5 by 5 you will see that you need a padding of 2 to actually keep the size the same. So let's take a look at more modern incarnations of CNNs. So um, basically you have a building block like that. You start with a convolution kernel, as I explained, then you have a batch normalization layer, and then some kind of nonlinear activation function. Uh, this can be a prelu, but it could be a normal relu, it could be a leaky relu, a sigmoid, whatever you want to use, right? Um, the batch normalization layer is there to, well, essentially normalize the data in each, in each layer. This is important because if you go deeper in your architectures, you can run into problems like vanishing gradients, for example, and uh, batch norm is one of the ways to, to counteract that. So this is pretty much present in all modern architectures um, and has been in favor of dropout earlier. Uh, dropout was mainly used, but batch norm is normally the, the standard today. Now if you take a look at the full architecture here, and this is one which could actually be used for contact prediction or distance prediction, um, you have three main parts of the system. The first one is the input part up here, then you have the main backbone part in the middle, and some kind of output part in the end. Now the first part here is not always needed, but in our case it is, because remember the input is really huge, or it can be really huge for, for a large L, for bigger proteins. So what this first stage here does is kind of an in input compression part. So we simply want to reduce the size of our data representations so we're not running into memory issues later on. Um, so what we do is we reduce these uh, 21 times 21 or 441 channels down to 128 and then to 64 and this is actually the number we use for the, for the backbone of the network and that keeps the size manageable and it doesn't blow up in terms of memory. Now in the, uh, oh yeah, and we only use one by one convolutions for this. This is the only thing you need for compression. But then in the actual backbone of the network, we're using five by five convolutions, obviously, since we want a bigger receptive field in this case. And uh, here in this one, we have seven of those blocks. This is essentially another hyperparameter. You just try to figure out how many do I need. You start small usually. And if you see, well, it actually improves when I add more layers, we add more and at some point, maybe it doesn't. So this is pretty much empirical. Then you get into an output layer in the end, and now it depends on what you want to predict. So for contact maps, you have just one channel, you just have probabilities for each residue pair, so it's one layer. 
um, and then a sigmoid since we want probabilities. Um, in case you want to predict distances, this is slightly different. Um, you are not having one channel, but B channels corresponding to the amount of bins that you use. And then you either just uh, use softmax as a nonlinear function here, um, or you skip that completely and go into cross entropy loss or whatever the framework actually decides for that, because that, that depends on what you actually use. So this is already outdated as well, <laughs> so sorry for that. But what's used nowadays really is this technique here, and this is a residual network. Um, so basically, when we're looking at the full network, there's not a big difference. We still have some input compression. We have the backbone, which now consists of residual blocks um, and output layers here. So this is one of these residual blocks in detail. Now, each residual block contains normal convolution layers. Um, in this case, I have two layers here with uh, five by five convolutions, although uh, this is just an example. So it could be just one layer, it could be more than two. This is another hyperparameter you need to optimize, so it's getting more complicated. Um, but the main point of this residual block is that you feed through the original input of your block and add this to the output. And you're really adding. You're not concatenating, you're really adding up, which has the advantage that the size stays the same. So that's convenient for the architecture. Now, the whole point of this is that you make um, less abstracted information from earlier stages available for later stages. If you would have a sequential architecture that runs through all of these channels, you would basically lose the less abstracted stuff from before. And this here gives the network the opportunity to rely on all the different intermediate representations at the same time. Now, in combination with batch normalization, this is pretty much the powerful technique to allow very deep architectures. And this is basically what you see for the big players like Facebook or Google. They have very, very deep architectures and they rely on, a, uh, uh, on these features, batch norm and residual networks. Um, what you can also see here, what I should mention, is that the order of the operations seems to be slightly shifted, right? So we're going into batch norm first here, then nonlinear nonlinear activation and then um, convolution. So this might seem strange, but the order is actually the same. It's, it just needs to be shifted like that. Um, what comes in here is the result of a convolution, or rather the addition here of results from convolution. So you do the batch norm next, right? This is only done in this way because you want to add the results from the convolutions and then batch normalize on this uh, added values, right? So this is, this is the point of this. Uh, which also means that after the last residu residual block, you need to be aware that you need to do batch normalization and nonlinear activation function to kind of complete this process. Okay, and the last thing I'm going to talk about in terms of deep learning are so-called dilated convolutions. Now, dilated convolutions are all about the receptive field. Um, in this case here, we have a default convolution, 9 by 9. We could also say that this is still a dilated convolution, but it has a dilation factor of 1. Um, so this has a receptive field of 9 by 9. This one here is a dilated convolution. It's a 3 by 3 convolution. As you see, it's three sample positions, but with a dilation factor of 4. That uh, dilation factor basically tells us how many positions do we skip between the sample positions. Now, why would we do that? Well, the idea is to increase the receptive field because this has a 9 by 9 receptive field just as this one here. But it gets away with much less free parameters, right? This has 81, this just has 9. Of course, we're missing all the points in between, but it's not so bad because we're still moving this thing across the whole input, okay? So the point is basically, if you want a large receptive field, but you want to be conservative with the free parameters, dilated convolutions are a good choice. And this is especially important if you want to go very, very, very deep, because then you need to be aware of the amount of free parameters, and we will get back to that when we look at one specific implementation later on. Okay, let's talk about CASP a little bit more. Um, I want to give you an idea where contact prediction actually sits within CUSP. Uh, so these are all the different categories in CUSP that we have nowadays. Many have been added over the years. You could imagine CUSP like being the Olympics, basically. And in the Olympics, you have many different sports disciplines. It's all sports, but they're all kind of a little bit different. And it's the same with CUSP as well. So uh, it's all about structure prediction, but there are many different ways to approach it. And this is reflected in the amount of categories that you see. The uh, most important original one is, of course, uh, the actual 3D structure that we want to infer. And there are different subcategories that have been added over the years. Uh, homology, fault recognition, de novo prediction, and so on. Um, also, originally we had Sacknear structure prediction in CASP, but this was cancelled after CASP 5 and is no longer present in there. And then we have um, another set of categories added, and you can see contact prediction was one of the first ones, so it's present since CASP 4, since it's so important. 
Now, also after a while, since Cup 7, we have additional sample categories because they realized, well, there are many, many differences in the difficulty of the samples that they use in the challenges. So uh, there are some for which we can actually find related structures, and those are in the template-based modeling category. As the name suggests, you can use these as a template, so you can do homology modeling on those. Um, on the other hand, you have some for which you cannot find any related structures, and these fall in the free modeling category. So this is more of a target list for de novo predictors, as you can imagine. Then, of course, there are some mixed samples, some where you cannot really say, is it one or the other category? You have some related structures, but not that many. Um, sometimes they're called TBM hard, sometimes TBM FM, and they're kind of looked at from both directions, right? So the de novo predictors sometimes incorporate them, and the homology ones always look at that, look at these as well. So, um, in terms of metrics, how does CUSP actually compare? So, in terms of contact prediction, we're having binary results, right? So, we have true positives, false positives, and so on, the typical results. So, you have the usual suspects, right? You have precision, you have recall, you have F-score, and the MCC, the Markov Correlation Coefficient. The MCC is especially interesting because it really factors in all possible results, and uh, true negatives are actually not present in the other ones. So, this is something to keep in mind. What we also do is we usually differentiate uh, in contact prediction between short, medium, and long range. And this is done because uh, we are specifically interested in the long range contacts because these give us the best constraints for the folding, right? If you imagine you have a sequence and you know there's a contact between very distant residues, then you know this, this kind of forms a loop here at least, right? This restricts the amount of freedom that you have significantly, whereas if you have two residues close by and you know they are in contact, it doesn't tell you much about the overall structure, right? So we're generally focusing on long-range contacts, meaning everything above 23 residues apart on the sequence level. Um, this is mostly the basis for comparison during CUSP. Now, is that everything that we need? Can we get away with all these metrics? Can we assess the quality of a contact predictor just by using those alone? That's the question now that I want to pose to you. Because what would you try to do when you're developing a contact predictor, would you try to maximize the amount of true positives or would you rather try to minimize the amount of false positives, assuming that you need to choose, right? Because in the, in the best world, you would try to get both. But if you have to choose one side, if you want to emphasize one side over the other, which one would you choose? Ideas? Well, we said that 2D to 3D is already kind of solved. Wouldn't it make sense just to make 3D from the 2D? and then see how well that overlays with the actual result? Yeah, you could do that. But let's assume we are stopping at contact prediction for now. We're not going for the full 3D structure. But of course, we need to keep in mind that we want to go there. That's kind of the point. But how could we assess the quality when we're just looking at the contact map? Keeping in mind that they should serve as constraints for our folding process. Okay, let's say you have to decide. Who's, who's, who's voting in favor of the first one? Okay, so the rest is for the second one, or who, who's? If, if we're, only, we're only looking at long range, or, or is we looking at everything? Um, specifically long range, yeah. It's specifically long range. Right. You need to have all the big folds in like, all the regions. Mm -hmm. If you mess up a little small one, it's not that bad, but you need to, like, I guess, get those big ones. Yeah, the problem is, what would happen if you have many false positives in your predictions. That would be bad for the folding, right? If you have inconsistencies, that's not great. This is why I also have the second part in there. What about networks that only predict very, very few positives, but they are all correct? So precision is 100%. Is that a quality criterion? Is that good? Maybe? Okay, let's say we have a predictor which is very conservative. It only predicts very few positives. Let's say it predicts 20 contacts. And they are all correct. No false positives, precision is 100%. Is that enough to infer the structure? It's the 20 most important contacts probably, maybe. Maybe. What if I tell you that the protein has 50 residues? Are 20 contacts enough? What if the protein has 800 residues? Is 20 enough? Is it exactly those 20 that help you get those big loops and those big moving instruments? Yeah. 
maybe, but you see the length plays some kind of role, right? So we need to get the length in at, at some point. And this is exactly what we do. So let's give you a solution. And also, by the way, this was kind of misleading because this is not actually the point. The point is really we need to factor in the length. So there's uh, another metric in CASP, which is called the top L precision. And this is really the, ma the main metric that is used for CASP uh, to compare different predictors. And the idea is here, we, we look at the precision in a certain sense, but with a catch. So what we do is we select the L, and this is kind of the length normalization, L being the length. We select the L most confident long-range predictions. And we do specifically not care if they are actually above the decision threshold. So let's assume we have a very conservative network. It only predicts five contacts as positives. Yeah? But we're not just taking the five. We take L. The L most confident ones, even if they're below 0.5 in their probability. Okay? We take all of them. And then we check if they actually correspond with contacts. And what that does is it gives us an indication on how reliable our system is. Right? We want that all the most confident predictions actually correspond to contacts. And we can also penalize these networks who, um, which... Um, like the previous one that I, that I said, which only predict very few positives, right? They could still score high if all the other predictions just below the threshold actually correspond to contacts. It's gonna, still going to still gonna be a good value, right? And what we want to see then in the end is development like this here. This is for, for one sample, it doesn't, doesn't matter which one. And it's also important to look at these different categories. So you take different amounts of them, right? So with L over 10, you only take the most confident ones. So for a protein with 100 residues, you only take the 10 most confident predictions. Here the 20 most, the 50 most, and the 100 most confident ones. And what you want to see here is a development like this. You really want your precision to increase the fewer you take into account. So for the most confident ones, you really want a high precision. And this is not always the case. You might assume, okay, this might always be the case. It's not. Um, you see many predictors for, this, for which this um, does not hold. So what you sometimes see is that precision actually increases for these categories. But if you take the most confident ones, it actually drops to zero because they're all wrong. And this can happen for some samples. And it's actually fairly normal that for all predictors this happens for some samples. But in general, on average, you really don't want a predictor that does that. Right? So this is kind of an important quality criterion for for contact predictors, and this is why it's used in, in the CASP challenges. Now, if you look at the recent developments in CASP, um, especially regarding contact prediction, we can see the general trend um, regarding deep learning reflected in here. So CASP 11, which was uh, 2014, if I'm not mistaken, um, concept, concept 2 was the winner in this case. Um, all of them were using evolutionary conservation, obviously, but this was still a traditional neural network with basically a sliding window approach. Now, Two years later, in CAS 12, 2016, uh, we had Raptor X Contact winning the competition this time, and this was already a deep learning method. So this was a pretty pretty complex CNN already. And this has just continued on. So a CASP 13, which happened last year, 2018. Uh, we've seen triplet rest, and the rest already indicates where the direction is going here. So we're having deep residual networks now, and pretty much all the best performing methods use this technique now. There's pretty much no exception now. Now, CAS 13 was also interesting because uh, we had um, a lot happening in other categories outside of contact prediction. Um, now, I think Professor Ross already mentioned AlphaFold, right? So we already discussed that. Now, I want to discuss that as well, even though it's not really a contact predictor in itself um, or a distance predictor because it really predicts the full 3D structure. But uh, when we're talking about modern approaches, we need to talk about AlphaFold and, um, because it's so special. AlphaFold was developed by DeepMind, which is a Google company, for CASP 13. Um, and actually, they won CASP 13, the tertiary structure prediction task, by a significant margin. And this was pretty remarkable because uh, most of the competitors in CASP, um, or at least the ones which perform reasonably well, um, are from groups which have, been, have a lot of experience, many years of experience in the field. And DeepMind was entering the field without any prior experience. It's the first time they actually um, contributed, and they won by such a large margin. This was completely unexpected, so this really took the field by surprise. So everyone was asking, okay, what are they doing? And we still don't really know because there's no official publication. And they also sadly mentioned that they have no plans of going open source. So we probably not will see the source code 
Um, but at least the paper would be nice. So everything we know so far is from presentations that they gave and they gave one uh, bigger presentation specifically about one part, lucky for us right now, and this is about their prediction of the distance histograms. So this is exactly our topic. But what they have is a much larger system, they actually use different uh, deep residual networks for other tasks and combine this in some way in the end and then go into a folding process with Rosetta but I cannot tell you anything about that since there's no information on that. But on this one there is a little bit, so I can tell you what they did. So, so far so unsurprising in terms of input, they do exactly the same as other methods do as well. They use evolutionary information. Um, they simply add some Wendy features, but other methods do this as well, like predicted secondary structure, predicted zone accessibility and things like that. Um, and the output is also not surprising. We have these histograms, so uh, a probability distribution here. Uh, with 64 bins, this is kind of normal because this is a pretty large amount of bins. Most other methods that tried this approach use less than that, but still the, the approach remains the same. Now, let's take a closer look at what they did. So basically they include everything that are introduced in the deep learning part. So they use deep dilated residual networks, and it looks something like this. So this is one of the residual blocks. They use three layers in between. The first and the last are simply feature scaling layers. So they have 128 feature channels in the main backbone, but reduce it down to 64 for the middle part, only to blow it up to 128 then again. This apparently works for them. Um, and in the middle part, we have the actual core convolution, which is uh, always a three by three convolution, but it's dilated. And they're cycling through these dilation values. They start with one, then two, four, and eight. So basically they blow up the receptive field. Um, and because this is a residual network, obviously all these different steps are carried through and all the later stages have at least certain access to them. Now what is really novel about this is that they use 220 of these residual blocks. So in general these are hundreds of layers because each block has three layers, so it's over 600 uh, convolution kernels which are running there, uh, times 64 of course. So this is really, really deep and this is much deeper than any other competitor ever tried. So we had deep residual networks, deep, well, uh, with 10 layers, 15 layers, 20 maybe for some methods, but uh, going this far no one has done. Uh, we have 21 million free parameters, which is a lot, but it's actually not that much. Um, yeah? In Casper, are there any restrictions on <coughs> processing power that you can use, or does everybody add? You can use their own CPU. So you, you, you use your own computers, so Google yeah. their computers. As far as I know, you hand in the actual results in the end, mm -hmm. the, the final prediction, so it doesn't really matter where they came from. You could have just done that manually by hand, basically. Right. Is, is, is there any suspicion that they basically just, they just have, they have so much more computing power that that's exactly how they be able to We will get there and we will get exactly there and to the problems caused by that, yes. So 21 million free parameters actually is not that much, right? We have uh, other deep learning systems even from some years ago which had more. This is mostly caused by these dilated convolutions, right? This is really where you save up a lot. But it's still really, really deep. And the question obviously becomes, how do they actually do that? How can they do that? Because input L times L, output L times L, if you do this for a couple hundred layers, you need to store all the intermediate results. How can they do this? Because even Google only has Tesla cards with up to 32 gigabytes of video RAM. So this is a natural restriction. They cannot go over that. How do they do that? Well, they don't. Simple as that. They do not push the full L times L through. And this is really the novelty of this approach. They train on crops. They only take 64 by 64 crops instead of the full input at the same time. So they basically take the original input, L times L, the coupling scores, and simply cut out these regions with random offsets. Uh, they also go a little bit off edge, up to 32 residues off edge, as you can see here. This is important because during inference and test time, you uh, want to have some overlap. You sample as much as you can, basically, and you average over these overlapping parts at each position, right? But the problem is, if you wouldn't go off edge, then you would have fewer uh, less averaging happening in the, in the corners and at the borders, right? So your accuracy would kind of drop off at the corners and um, to avoid that they're having these off-edge uh, sampling positions. Now, they claim that this is kind of a data augmentation technique because they say that they can produce a large amount of crops from one sample, right? 
I kind of disagree because if you push the full sample through, you're still visiting all possible positions with your convolution kernels, right? So I'm not, not sure if this is really the case. I think the much more important argument is really the memory consumption. They have to do this because otherwise it wouldn't fit into GPU memory. It's simple as that. And also, if you actually do the math and compute how much does it actually take, they are right at the limit. So the size of the network, the, the, the amount of layers and um, the uh, intermediate representations that you get for 64 by 64 is pretty much right at the limit of 32 gigabytes of video RAM. So this is what we can do. Um, one advantage obviously is if you use these crops is that you can use mini batches. You couldn't do that before. One reason was that the input is simply too large. You cannot put more than one sample through at a time. And the other thing is L is dynamic, right? If you have different proteins with different lengths, the input representations have different size. You cannot put them in a batch and push them through the network. But now with these crops you can. Theoretically. And now we exactly get to this point of can we actually do this? Can we do this? Oh wait, let's, let's, let's talk about um, how the cropping actually works and how well it works, kind of as an argument for why we choose 64 by 64 before we get into the complexity issue. Um, now this is some testing that I did on a network which was actually trained on the full input, producing the full output. But then of course you can simply evaluate on crops and simply see does it still work because the network can handle any arbitrary size, right? You can just try 64 by 64 or 32 by 32 and see how does it impact the performance. Does it go down or does it not? And the interesting thing is really 64 by 64 is already a pretty conservative choice because no matter what kind of strides or what kind of overlap you have, you're still having 0.6 performance, which is also the baseline performance, by the way, if you not use crops at all. And even if you go down to 30, uh, 32, and even if you go to 16, as long as you have enough overlap, you're still having baseline performance. This is pretty remarkable and this was kind of surprising for many people, including myself, because I thought that at least for the long range context that you need a wider receptor field to actually capture them. But apparently that's not the, not the case. You can get away with less than that. So AlphaFold has chosen 64 by 64 as kind of a conservative choice and that works fairly well for them. So now we get into the issue, can we actually reproduce that? Before I move to the slide, let's think about that. So let's assume you want to do a mini batch with 100 samples, okay? Now how do you get these crops? Do you need to load the L times L thing? Do you need to cut out the crop? Store that in your, in your batch. Then you load in the next one and the next one. You do this 100 times per training iteration. And remember these L times L inputs are gigabyte sized. Well, that's a problem. <coughs> you cannot really do that. It's, it, it, it's going to take forever. You cannot train like that. So this is the first issue. So dynamically sampling the crops takes way too long. You cannot do that. Okay, we could do it the other way around. We could say, okay, we pre-generate all possible crops and simply store them on disk. And then we have them kind of bite-sized. We can load them in. That's no problem, right? Well, it is a problem because if you try to calculate how many do you get and how much space does this actually take? If you imagine you have a protein with 500 residues, how many crops do you get? How many possible crops do you have? It's something in the ballpark of 500 times 500 of these crops. And each crop has the size 64 by 64 types 441. These are deep, right? So this becomes very, very big, very, very quickly. And this would be like dozens, if not hundreds of terabytes. Um, and remember, we still want a fast access to them. We still want them on an SSD to push them into GPU memory as quickly as we can. So that's not feasible, at least not with our computational resources. And this is exactly the point because DeepMind as a Google company and one of the primary companies pushing this, um, they probably have the resources. They can do that. I'm not sure which one they take. I assume they would rather go the disk space route because in the end it's cheaper. Um, if you have a data center, you can maybe do this. Um, a large, um, any larger company might be able to do that, but a small research team might not have the resources to do that. Um, this is hinting at a potential problem in the field because um, if it actually shows that you need these computational resources to compete, that means we are out, right? So it's the question how this develops. Um, maybe you can get away with more clever ideas, but maybe you need clever ideas plus the computational resources. We'll see how that develops. So in contrast to that, we'll take a look at a more realistic example, something that you could actually do um, on smaller machines. And I don't want to hide the fact that this is actually from my master thesis. So basically what you've seen in the early deep learning part, the residual network that you've seen, uh, this is actually my architecture for that. And I will now uh, fill in the holes basically and tell you a little bit more about the process.
So first things first, when you want to develop some kind of machine learning device, you need to think about data first because everything depends on that. If you train on garbage, well, you get garbage out. So in this case, I was kind of lucky because we already had a data set prepared for several different projects um, with around uh, 4,000 high quality structures from PDB. Obviously you need uh, PDB since you need the structures for supervised training. Um, we had some restrictions on those, uh, just a single chain, for example, making things a little bit easier, no metals involved, uh, and a certain quality of the resolution, obviously, uh, to have high enough accuracy. So then starting from the original faster files, from the sequences, we use, as, uh, we use HH suit to produce our multiple sequence alignments, filter them a little bit, remove redundancy, convert, and then um, eventually go into CCM pred as our DCA tool to get the evolutionary coupling scores, which are the main input of the method, right? So L times L times 441. Uh, the databases used uh, were two. Uh, we had Uniclass 30 as kind of the default choice that you would, that would use in this case. And we also luckily had access to a metagenomics database um, which was helpful because we could do some analysis and comparison of different versions of alignments uh, based on one or the other database. Now then you need to, of course, immediately think about your validation set and your final holdout sets that you only look at at the very end. Um, so for a validation set, we simply used a fixed random selection of around uh, 200 samples. And for the final holdout sets, um, this is of course not, uh, not difficult for contact prediction since we have CUSP. Um, so obviously we could use the free modeling targets from the last two CUSP challenges. And also the Psych of 150 test set, which was quite useful because this is used by David Jones at UCL. Um, uh, who's one of the guy, or this is one of the group that develops many of these contact predictors. So this gives us lots of, option, lots of options to uh, actually compare to existing methods. Now, of course, what you need to do is you need to redundancy reduce to make sure that you do not have any training samples which are somehow similar to anything in the validation set or the final evaluation set. And in this case, we use CDHIT for that. Then also, uh, maybe you remember the elbow embeddings that uh, Michael Heinzinger talked about in his lecture last month. Um, since um, I wanted to not only use the evolutionary coupling scores, but also try um, an input which is not based on multiple sequence alignments, kind of to try to move away from um, the MSAs, which would be a huge boon if we could actually do that in the field, because the MSAs are really the bottleneck in the whole part. Um, even though um, a network, when it is trained, can do inference in milliseconds, that doesn't really help you if you need a full day to compute the MSA for some sample, right? So moving away from, from the evolutionary information would be, would be great. And one way to do that would be to use ELMO embeddings. Now to quickly recap what ELMO actually does. So ELMO embeddings are the hidden states of a bidirectional LSTM originally used in natural language processing. And this was used to uh, predict either the next or the previous word, depending on which direction you're looking at, in a sentence. Um, now in bioinformatics you can do pretty much the same thing, you're just training on biodatabases, on sequence databases, and you're trying to predict the next or the previous residue. And after training the system, you can then feed in a sequence and extract the hidden states of these LSTMs. And this basically gives you a protein representation. You do not really understand what it is, but it is a latent space representation that you can then use um, as an input to machine learning systems. And this is unrelated to the evolutionary information inf uh, inputs that we, that we use in conjunction with that. This, of course, allows us to make comparisons. How does the system behave if we just train on one type of input, we train on both types of input, and uh, we'll see some comparisons on that. So, first though, if you have one-dimensional inputs, like the ELMO inputs, you have the problem to, you have to somehow get it into a 2D architecture, right? Because uh, for the contact maps, having 2D convolutions here, and we need to somehow push our 1D input in. And uh, you do this in a relatively naive way, but uh, even AlphaFold doesn't uh, use anything else, so they're doing the same thing for their 1D inputs. So basically, if you have some inputs, 1D feature L times N, N is in this case for L inputs 1K, you simply duplicate these values along this axis to make an L times L representation. And you not only do this in one direction, you also do this in the other direction and then you concatenate both. And in this way you get this pairwise information that you need for the 2D pipeline. And after you do this, you concatenate with the original 2D inputs that you had. 
and go into the full backbone. Now, the problem is for these Elmo inputs, again, this is a depth of 1K. If you do this in both directions um, and concatenate, you have L times L times 2K. This is pretty big, so we do not really want that. Um, so we do the same thing that we do with the EC inputs as well. We first reduce the amount of feature channels significantly. We get on to 128 and then to 64, and then we do the expansion, and this is more manageable in terms of memory. So then we concatenate and go into the backbone. This is actually a slight mistake. This should be uh, the beginning of the residual network, right? Not the normal sequential one. So just imagine this is the first, uh, the first residual block of the network. Okay, so now for some results. So uh, let me first explain what you see here. So this is a comparison, a per sample comparison on the validation set of MCC. So each dot here is one sample. Um, and the color coding here on this bar uh, indicates how uh, many sequences we have in the underlying MSA. So the more bluish it is, the more rich the MSA is, and the more reddish, the fewer sequences we have in there. And for the worst cases, it's only just a handful or maybe sometimes even none. Um, as you can clearly see at first glance uh, for both methods, um, it's obviously performing well for the rich MSAs and the performance is pretty bad for, for the shallow ones as expected. No big surprise here. So what you see is a comparison of two different networks. One network is only trained on evolutionary coupling scores. The other network is trained on the coupling scores plus the ELMO inputs. So we can check if that actually gives us some advantage. And in general, you can see, well, not, not a big advantage, but there's something happening here. This is quite interesting. So for some of the samples, especially ones which are relatively bad, um, our original network just on the ECs was not able to make any inference at all, right? performance was just zero. But if we add the ELMO inputs, we actually get somewhere, at least. So that's, that's already not bad. But we could also look at what happens if we train only on ELMO. So that's somehow better. So we here have a network trained with ELMO, so coupling scores plus ELMO, and one network with ELMO only. And as you can clearly see, we still need the evolutionary information. It's not gonna cut it. Just using ELMO is pretty bad, except <coughs> for a few samples here, for ones with really bad MSAs. And this is kind of surprising, right? I mean, in the previous one, we had a network trained on both, and it's kind of understandable why we have these outliers here, right? But then we compare this with the Elmo only network, and we still get some here. Why, do, why is that happening? Why do we not have some, um, some more information on the network trained on both? Right? Should be able to do something with those. Well, as it turns out, if you analyze those a little bit further, you'll see that this goes back to the uh, point that I made a few slides before uh, about the amount of true positives and false positives. Right? Um, what happens here is that the predictor only based on ELMO is very bold. So it predicts many positives, but many of them are actually wrong. This is why we get something out of this here. Whereas if we train on both inputs, it's a bit more conservative. And it's good that it is because in the end, these predictions are actually not usable for folding because they're all over the place. Too many false positives in there. So yeah, the moral of the story is um, ELMO isn't quite cutting it, but we are certainly moving in the right direction by trying to use more inputs which are not based on evolutionary information. Now for some general performance analysis, so this is a um, comparison on the Psycov 150 test set um, with some of the more recent methods from David Jones, which uh, originally published this set. Um, we have CCM print here as kind of a baseline because random baseline doesn't make sense because it's so unbalanced anyway, it's gonna be very low. But CCM print is kind of a useful baseline here as a comparison. Um, and then we're comparing with MetaCycov2 and DeepCov. DeepCov is a relatively recent method from uh, John's lab from 2018. As you can see, well, we're performing pretty well. It's pretty good. Uh, we factor in the error bar. We sadly do not have errors for the other methods, but uh, here we are quite a bit better. Now, when we look at CASP12, the picture becomes a bit different. So uh, first, sorry for this wall of numbers. Um, let me walk you through that. So what you see here are the CUSP-12 free modeling targets, so the harder targets in each row, um, and a comparison between MetaCycov, Raptor X Contact, and our method. These two are actually the winners in the contact prediction category in CUSP-12, um, and indicated in bold are the best top L results in the respective category for the respective sample. So you could basically just glance at it and just see where is it more bold than in other areas. And in, it's really hard to say if one predictor is really better than the other, right? They're all a little bit different. They perform better or worse on certain samples. Um, 
Yeah, what I'm a little bit frustrated about is the fact that I wanted to specifically increase the performance for the worst samples, so the ones with uh, lacking evolutionary information, because I thought maybe the ELMO inputs push this a little bit further and maybe give us an edge. Didn't quite happen. We're actually performing better on the on the more rich samples, sadly. But uh, anyway, so still we are kind of on 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 par with the with the other methods. Now I wanted to focus on one of these samples specifically. This one here, 870 domain one, uh, which is interesting because our predictor was actually performing pretty nicely. Um, just, yeah. Well, you can finish explaining, but I just had a question about where were you able to like maybe stratify the like the domains there and see in which groups Sadikov performed best, which groups Rapp performed best, and which groups yours performed best, hmm. to maybe kind of say for based on what type of protein you have, you might want to use this, this, or this tool. Mm -hmm. has, there, has anybody looked at that? Or? No. <laughs> but it would be, interesting. It would be interesting, yeah. yeah. <coughs> sure. Just for the user, because then at the end, if you, if you have something like that, you would have no idea which tool to use, but then if you had some information about your protein, mm -hmm. then it's known that metapsychop is best, like you were saying, work with low evolutionary information uses, mm -hmm. a lot of evolutionary or middle uses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure if we could actually say that. The problem is even for... <coughs> or it's just completely mixed, always. Mm -hmm. if, like, it might not even be possible to stratify, of course, but... Yeah. Yeah, the problem is also the NF is not always a good indicator. For example, this one here should be a relatively easy sample, right? Mm. You can see this is not quite the case, so it's not always not always an easy correlation here. Uh, I believe may, may we introduce what NF means? Sorry? Yeah, what, you say, what, what does NF mean? What is that? Um, that is the number of effective sequences in the alignment. So this is basically the same um, as the color coding in the previous graphs. Okay. So this gives you an indication of uh, how easy the sample would be or how rich the MSA is. So the assumption is that the higher the number, the more information is in the alignment. Mm. Yep. The easier it should be because you have a lot. Yeah. The higher the score should be in the end, and mostly this is true, but as you can see, not always, right? It's not always that easy. So that so even has the absolute highest NF on the, on the entire scale with 4.5, but it has pretty abysmal scores. <laughs> yes. Is, is that yes. But I mean, it's got to be known what that is then, or is that some kind of like disordered or... Yeah, we just have to take, take a closer look. And this is a good bridge now to the point I want to make now, because these top L values are sometimes a bit misleading. You have to be careful here. Let's look at one sample, 870 D1. So this is one where our predictor is actually performing surprisingly well compared to the others. So I had to take a closer look at this one and see what's going on. This is pretty interesting. So this is a relatively smallish protein. You can see here the uh, predicted contacts and the ground truth, as far as the projector permits it, at least. Um, and as you can see here, the predicted long-range contacts, so the one a bit further away from uh, the diagonal here, are really clustered here, right? And there's much more that we could predict and we didn't. Still, the top L precision is not bad. And what happens here, if you look at the full structure, so this is a visualization of all these long-range contacts, now there's a problem, right? So these are all clustered here in this area. So the question is, is this good to infer the full structure? Probably not, right? You can probably say something about this region, but the whole protein, probably not. So this really highlights the importance of looking at different <coughs> metrics all the time, not just rely on one, certainly not only on top L, also look at MCC and, and other values.